Thank you, everyone. Hello and happy Friday. I'm Mark Finley. I'm the fellow in energy and global oil with the Baker Institute Center for Energy Studies. Thank you for joining us today, making time in your schedules to join us on a Friday for our weekly uh, webinar, which this week is focused on the oil market. I hope each of you and your loved ones are keeping well. The oil market's been on a wild ride over the past year. Oil remains by far the world's largest energy source. And as we've seen, changes in global supply, demand, and prices still have profound implications for our economy, for geopolitics, and of course, for sustainability. Over the past year alone, we've seen the biggest ever decline in demand, the largest voluntary production cuts in history, delivered by the so-called OPEC Plus Group. But only after a brief price war, which helped to drive prices sharply lower, including famously, as you all know, a brief episode of negative prices here in the US. And that in turn helped drive the most rapid decline on record of US oil production. But now we've eagerly turned the page to 2021 and everything's back to normal, isn't it? Well, the world is hopefully beginning its recovery from the global COVID-19 pandemic. Oil demand is improving, but not yet fully recovered. Diesel fuel has done relatively well as we all sit at home and order takeout and exercise equipment. Gasoline demand, on the other hand, recovers, but personal mobility is still constrained, and unfortunately, with new lockdowns looming now in Europe. Jet fuel has seen the biggest declines you know, on, you know, of any fuel as air travel remains well below pre-COVID levels, and all of this has had a big impact on refiners as well as producers. On the supply side, the OPEC Plus Group continues today to hold roughly 8 million barrels a day of supply off the market. And that includes an additional voluntary cut of a million barrels a day from Saudi Arabia. How quickly will these producers turn back to adding supply into the market? And will they be able to maintain the extraordinary discipline that we've seen, avoiding temptation to cheat on quotas? Here in the US, production remains way below pre-pandemic levels as companies are really focused on financial discipline and shareholder returns. Globally, oil inventories have been correcting, although recently here in the US, the deep freeze in Texas and the central US have disrupted both supply and refining, complicating the oil market picture. Oil prices recovered as inventories have rebalanced and recently returned to pre-COVID levels. <laughs> but yesterday's drop of nearly five bucks reminds us how tenuous that recovery really is. And beyond the tactical short-term dynamics of this year, we also want to know what this all means more strategically. There's been a surge of analysts calling for a peak in global oil demand, arguing that the pandemic and more aggressive climate policies mean that oil demand will decline going forward. And of course, this being the oil market, there's been an equally vocal crowd arguing the opposite, that demand will recover, but supply will falter due to the collapse in investment, driving the next so-called super cycle spike in oil prices. There's a critical nexus of factors for us to explore today, behavioral issues, policy, economics, and technology. All of these make it a particularly interesting, that is to say, uncertain time for the oil market. On the demand side, most importantly, Will the COVID-19 virus be controlled? Or will mutations and lax attitudes make for a long-term management challenge? Will the surge that we've seen in, in telecommuting stick? Or will people drive even more as they avoid rapid transit while going back to work? When will air travel return? As we reopen, will we see a surge in so-called revenge travel as many analysts are expecting? Will green stimulus speed the arrival of EVs and other technologies that reduce oil demand? Or will conventional stimulus boost oil demand along with economic growth? And the supply side questions are equally impactful. Will the collapse of investment drive a shortage of supply and push prices higher? Or will countries with large conventional resources try to maximize production and market share to monetize their resources? as climate policies threaten to leave them in the ground? <laughs> Here in the US, how will shale producers and their investors balance tension between financial discipline and profit opportunities? 
where will shale economics wind up sitting on the global supply curve and how will policy changes impact that outlook? And as always, the bottom line in the oil market, what does all this mean for oil prices and for CO2 emissions? We have a great panel here to discuss these issues and our timing is perfect. The International Energy Agency publishes what I think is the world's most influential oil market outlook. And just this week, the IEA released its latest short-term oil market report, as well as its annual five-year outlook. That outlook, by the way, is available to download at the IEA's website. We have the great privilege today of receiving a presentation from Toro Bosoni, who leads the IEA's Oil Industry and Markets Division, the group that produces these outlooks. Toro is joining us today from Paris to walk us through the IEA's brand new outlooks. We'll then have a brief discussion of the key points with two world-class energy analysts, Helen Curry, Chief Economist of ConocoPhillips, and Colin Fenton, Chair of Commodities in the Advisory Practice of Houston's Tudor Pickering Holt. Our speaker bios are available online. And importantly, we will also take your questions, which you can submit using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Note that you'll be able to see only your question and not all of the questions being submitted. And we'll do all of this in 75 minutes. For those of you watching from here in the United States, I'm happy to report that we'll finish in time for you to polish off your March Madness bracket before the first tip off. And I have to say, go blue. With that, let me turn to our speakers. Toro, welcome and over to you. And you're on mute. Sorry, that had to come, right? Thank you, Mark. Um, and thank you for having me today. It's great honor, uh, great introduction and many, many questions. I hope um, I'll be able to answer some of them uh, through the panel today. Uh, so let me just share my presentation. Can you see it? Yeah. Um, so let me see. Okay. Um, here we go. Yeah. So today, as you said, um, we published our short term, medium term, uh, or short term oil market outlook along with the medium term outlook on Wednesday uh, of this week. Um, as Mark said, the reports are both available on our website. Uh, so before I go, I will focus today on, on the medium term outlook and how we see uh, some of these uh, developments evolving over, over the coming years to 2026. But first, just a few words on the, on the shorter term outlook. So as Mark said, I updated this price graph a few days ago. So we don't see the, the, the dip down that from yesterday after we released our latest oil market report. But as you know, cruise price prices have been rising steadily from since last May and more recently uh, since November of last year, steady upward um, run uh, and hitting $70 in early March. So there's a few things that we see sort of playing in, into that uh, in the, behind this, this bull run that we've seen in crude oil prices. And first and foremost, uh, it's as you know, the oil, mar oil markets, they are rebalancing. Uh, we're seeing inventories in the OECD and globally um, really come down to levels um, since from the peak levels that we saw in July and August of last year. But the point that we wanted to make in our last oil market update is that still, even in January, when oil markets, uh, oil inventories in the OECD continue to fall, um, OECD global total stocks still look relatively comfortable compared to historical levels. So we're working off the overhang that built up last year. Uh, oil inventories are continuing to draw as demand for the time being are exceeding supply globally. Um, but we're not, we're, we're still seeing oil stocks relatively comfortable compared to historical levels. And of course, um, oil supply um, tumbled in the last, in, in February. This is, is a lot to do with the OPEC plus agreement uh, and the voluntary cut that Saudi Arabia put in place, agreeing to cut production by another million barrels a day on top of the, the cuts that they already had in place. But also of course, the Texas freeze 
uh, that shut in a large part of uh, production in the Permian. Uh, we're estimating that to more than a million barrels a day. Gas supplies were also obviously affected by the freeze. Um, and looking into the rest of the remainder of the year, we're seeing a recovery in some of the supplies from non-OPEC sources. Um, and also um, on the assumption that the, the cuts that OPEC Plus had put in place will be eased in the second half of the year. But of course now uh, OPEC Plus decided at the beginning of March to extend the cuts into April to the surprise of many market observers. Uh, and the Saudis also decided to roll over its voluntary cut for an extra month. So this really supported the prices in the near term. So as I said, we're seeing a recovery in supplies from non-OPEC, but relatively modest growth. Um, those producers not part of the OPEC plus agreement uh, are increasing by about 700,000 barrels a day, which is a half of the decline that we saw last year. So what does it mean in terms of our market balances? Uh, the demand recovery is still fragile. Um, as you know, we have new lockdowns here in Europe. Uh, the, the COVID situation is improving in many parts of the world with vaccine programs uh, advancing, but it is a, a fragile recovery. We do expect very strong growth in demand in the second half of the year. Our forecast is for oil demand to grow by about 5 million barrels a day from the first quarter of this year until the fourth quarter of the year, uh, underpinned by stronger economic growth, also driven by stimulus packages in the US and Europe and elsewhere. Um, industrial activity has been very strong so far this year, and we're seeing that mobility is also surprising to the upside. So we do expect a strong recovery in oil demand, which would require um, and or leave room uh, for OPEC plus to ease the production cuts that they have in place now. So just the last chart, as Mark said in his introduction, um, there is plenty of spare capacity in the OPEC plus uh, to, to meet that oil demand growth. We, in, as of February, we estimate that the OPEC crude capacity, spare capacity, is nearly 8 million barrels a day. The other non-OPEC countries taking part of that deal holding 1.5, 1.6 million barrels a day, that is Russia, Kazakhstan, and the other countries. And this is oil that could be brought to market in short order. So as I said, we're seeing a continued market rebalancing um, to demand recovery although fragile in the near term, uh, are expect, is expected to pick up strongly, but there is plenty of OPEC spare capacity to meet that demand. And in the meantime, we have the OECD or global oil stocks um, to, to, to fill the gap. So with that, I'm going to look into the um, focus on some of the messages from our oil 2021 report that we also published um, this week. Uh, and as you know, we're now, um, exactly one year after the first lockdowns here in France and in a lot of part, a larger parts of the world. Uh, and as you know, we had uh, we had oil demand falling by about 9 million barrels last year. Uh, we are seeing a very strong recovery in 2021, although we do expect um, the recovery um, to recoup about 60% of the volumes lost last year. As you see, we have a strong recovery, but the whole oil demand forecast has shifted lower uh, after the pandemic. Um, but as you can see here also, that while the curve has shifted lower and the tw or 2025 forecast is about two and a half million barrels a day lower than our pre-pandemic forecast, um, the curve has not uh, shifted dramatically even with the changes that we see affecting all demand, be it on behavior, increased push uh, to, for energy transition and so forth. So we're seeing uh, that in the absence of stronger policy push or behavioral changes that we're expecting now, oil demand is set to, to rise every year to 2026. So um, in our base case, the way we see things now, the current policy environment, uh, there's no oil demand peak in, in our forecast to 2026. So here, from, from the very low uh, demand numbers in 2020, we're expecting um, growth of about 13 million barrels a day uh, to 2026. Um, you can see here from the top part of the charts that growth will come from all regions uh, as part of the recovery. But if we look at the bottom part of the chart, um, which, which compares the demand in 2026 
um, to the pre-pandemic levels, we see quite a different pictures. Uh, oil demand is only four and a half million barrels a day higher. And we can see that it's really the, the, the non-OECD Asia region that is accounting for the majority of, of growth. The, the, um, the developed countries in the OECD uh, are set to decline um, from the, compared to the 2019 levels. So we're seeing diverging pictures as we've seen before, OECD demand declining. Uh, we can say that that has peaked and continued to decline where strong growth is coming from the non-OECD Asian countries and also some other regions such as the Middle East. In terms of products, um, this chart is a little bit busy, but on the left-hand side, you can see the year-on-year -year changes in oil demand in terms of products. The, the right-hand graph is looking at the changes compared to the 2019 levels. And the point we wanted to make here is to see how the recovery is spread across the different sectors and products. Um, and what's, what is striking is that the LPG ethane and NAFTA categories, which is primarily used for petrochemical feedstocks, are growing very strongly uh, and, and counting for about 70% of demand growth to 2026 compared to the pre-pandemic levels. Uh, gasoline, we expect it not to recover, even though uh, mobility in the developing world uh, are increasing. We're seeing efficiency improvement, the rise of electric vehicles, uh, changes to behavior in terms of commuting, of impacting the, the demand for gasoline and personal transport in the OECD regions. Uh, jet fuel, uh, we don't expect it to recover to the pre-pandemic levels until 2024. Uh, a growth in diesel and gas oil is also slowing, although industrial activity lately has provided some uh, strength to this part of the barrel. Um, as I said, the gasoline uh, demand growth is, the gasoline demand is expected to slow. A large part of this is coming from the rise of electric vehicles. We're seeing a very strong uptick in the, the EV sales in Europe, for instance, also in China. Our estimate is that um, we will have 70 million cars uh, on the road uh, by 2026. Uh, China, of course, is growing the most strongly, but we're seeing also in, in Europe and the US very strong increases. And also the efficiency improvements uh, for the vehicle fleet is, is providing a, a big um, impact on, on the gasoline uh, and diesel for, for personal vehicles. So, but we wanted to look at see the question is really that we're asked is what would it take uh, for oil demand to climb in this period? So we looked at it. So we look we, in our base case, we're seeing oil demand growing from a, just under 100 million barrels a day in 2019 to 104 in 2026. And we looked at the different areas uh, where we could really make a change uh, and have to see the peak in oil demand um, as countries. Um, as you know, many countries are aligning about around just uh, stronger environmental goals, uh, net zero emission targets, um, and, and so forth to mid-century 2050, 2030, or sometimes even earlier. So we looked at what it would take to get on track for sort of to meet those ambitions. So in the first, we're looking at, well, if if fuel efficiencies um, improvements in the car could push forward uh, by one year, we can, we can reduce oil demand by about a million barrels a day compared to our, our base case. Of course, efficiency improvements are already factored into our forecast uh, by and reducing the oil demand. We looked at the changes to behaviors. Um, in our base case, we're assuming um, that teleworking would continue to stay with us through the medium term. I think that many of us now after a year working more or less from home have found that uh, a lot of things can be done more efficiently. We, we looked at how, how big of a portion of the working population can work from home that have jobs that are that are able to do from home, which how, how large of a share of the, of the, the transport fuels is used for commuting. Um, so we're assuming that in the developed world where you have a greater potential from working from home, um, people will work that can work, will work from home about one or two days a week. And we looked at, well, if that was increased to three days a week, and we also had more teleworking in the non-OECD uh, countries, we could, raise, we could 
decreased demand by about a million barrels a day. We also looked at business travel. Business travel accounts for about 20% of aviation uh, demand. So we, we looked at, at, and we're assuming that there will be some reductions here. So, so we factored that into our forecast. It, then we looked at the EVs. If we increase the EV fleet by about 50% compared to our base case, so that if we have uh, 90 million barrels, 90 million cars uh, on the road by 2026, as you can see, the reduction in, in fuel demand is relatively small at about a half a million barrels a day. The biggest impact that we get is looking at additional policies. This will include phasing out heating fuels for um, heating oil for, for in the residential areas where it's used, phasing out crude oil uh, and fuel oil and power generation, looking at subsidies where they are in place, and also at, the, at reducing um, petrochemical demand by looking at the plastic, increasing recycling uh, rates and so forth. So by taking all of these policies and changes combined, we could see oil demand um, decreasing for compared to the 19, 2019 levels. Um, but I have to say that this is very ambitious and, and the changes would have to happen now. So we're looking at, in our case, our, our base case, uh, where, where these changes are not coming through, oil demand continues to grow in the medium term. So, but the, the growing ambitions for climate change, uh, climate targets, uh, net zero targets, uh, has created uh, an increased uncertainty about the oil demand forecast. Uh, and that's, um, of course, playing into the minds of the, the oil producers, I'm sorry, um, so global upstream investments um, east last year fell by 30% last year compared to what uh, companies had outlined in terms of spending at the start of the year and compared to the 2019 levels. Uh, the investment cuts were uh, spread around all types of companies, but of course, as you know, the biggest cuts was made for US independence that cut their spending about 50%, more than 50% compared to the 2019 levels. IOCs by about 30%, where the national oil companies cut by a lesser 20% compared to the previous years. Now we're looking at, despite the, the rising prices over the last uh, months, uh, since the end of the year, the rebalancing of the market, uh, we're seeing very little, uh, few signals of increased investment for 2021. There are some marginal increases from IOCs and, and, and some of the independent producers, um, but relatively flat uh, investment pictures uh, for 2021. Of course, it's the uncertain outlook for demand that is playing into the, uh, to the pictures, but also this enormous spare capacity cushion that I talked about in my introductions. So looking at the, the investment cuts, uh, that, that we've seen, um, along with delays to project sanctioning, uh, project development caused by COVID uh, logistical issues and so forth, means that the, the capacity building in, in global capacity building has slowed over the past year. We're only seeing production capacity increasing by 5 million barrels a day, slightly less uh, perhaps, um, and that sort of pales in compared to the oil demand growth um, that we're expecting over the period. But as I said, ample spare capacity, mostly in the Middle East, uh, should help keep markets comfortable uh, through the 2026 um, period. So in terms of countries, um, we're expecting growth to come um, primarily um, from the Middle East, uh, as the, 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 Middle East, the, the key Gulf producers uh, are restoring production that was shut in last year. Um, and as you can see here, um, US is still featured as, as the largest source of supply growth, um, but it pales, it's, it's a very different picture than what we've seen in recent year. Uh, from 2013 to 2019, I think US production grew by about 7 million barrels a day, almost four just over uh, 2018 and 2019. So, the 1.6 million barrels a day of growth that we're projecting for now for the US 
uh, is, is, a, is a very sharp slowdown indeed from the recent trends. Um, and as I said, supply needs to re rise by 10 million barrels a day to 2026 to meet um, the, the demand growth. Uh, so we will have to draw down um, the spare capacity. Here, just uh, a few words on the US. Um, we have revised down our uh, outlook for US oil supply for the next five years um, based on, um, on statements and, and strategies uh, from, from companies operating in the US. Uh, it appears that there is a new investment strategy uh, for companies that were that um, producers are prioritizing um, uh, investor returns, paying back debt, and so forth, not just growth. Um, of course, so um, with the current prices though, um, we do recognize that um, that, that the producers could stick, stick to those pledges and still have free cash flows to increase uh, investment and, and return to growth in the coming years. So how, what does it look like to 2026? Well, we're seeing as, um, as demand increases and with modest growth in capacity uh, from outside uh, the group, uh, spare capacity uh, in the OPEC plus countries are being drawn down. By 2026, we still see uh, about two and a half million barrels a day of spare, which is the lowest level since 20, 2016. Um, but of course here, we also have, um, we have the Iran uh, issue, the Iranian production um, that could come back to market over the next, uh, the next five years. If sanctions were eased on, on Iran, we think that an additional 1.7 million barrels a day of capacity could be brought back to market. I hear it, it's the same pictures. Of course, um, we're watching very closely what's happening in Iran, um, but for now, we're just holding production flat at current levels. We've seen an uptick in recent months, um, but we're not factoring in uh, or trying to second guess when the sanctions on or on Iran could be lifted. So just before finishing up, I wanted to talk about the downstream refining sector a little bit. Um, of course, uh, the, down, the, the refining industry has been going through changes, uh, significant changes over the last few years. Uh, and we're seeing that, um, that the downstream migration continues here, as we say. The problems that the refinery industry have been dealing with for the past few years had just been accentuated by the COVID crisis, uh, oil demand collapsing and shifting lower, uh, whereas capacity continued to build uh, based on projects that were put in place uh, before the crisis. So we're seeing that um, new capacity coming online of more than 8 million barrels a day uh, through the 2026 uh, are creating uh, an increased pressure on the refining sector. We saw in 2020 already announced shutdowns of three and a half million barrels a day. So we're having net additions uh, of refinery capacity about five million barrels a day. East of Suez, this is Asia and the Middle East, um, pri primarily accounting for 90% of the increase. So with 5 million barrels a day of net new capacity, uh, you can see here on the right-hand side, um, it's, it still uh, exceeds uh, the refined product demand. Um, as I said, total oil demand is set to grow by about 4 million barrels a day uh, from 2019. But we, if we exclude the products that are not coming from the refining sector, be it biofuels, uh, gas to liquid, um, NGLs that go directly fractionated and going directly to the petrochemical sector, we only need about 3 million barrels a day of, um, of, of new capacity uh, for this refined uh, product demand. So we're looking at the third round of global refinery closures. We've seen three, two, three episodes uh, since the, the, the 1970s, uh, one in the 80s after the, the in, in the 80s, we shut about 12 million barrels a day of capacity. 
again in 20, uh, after the financial crisis of 20, 2008, 2009, 7 million barrels a day of capacity were closed. And now we're looking in this phase that we, uh, that 6 million barrels a day of capacity will have to be shut. So we're expecting more closures uh, to be announced um, in, in the year or two ahead. So just in terms of refining activity, uh, the trends mirror those on the demand side, uh, east of Suez, Asia primarily, increasing their activity very strongly. We expect these trends to continue. Where it's relatively steady uh, throughput levels in the Atlantic Basin, the US, Europe, uh, Latin America, and um, West Africa. So what does it mean for crude and product flows? Uh, of course, with Asian uh, refinery activity increasing very strongly, uh, its import needs are increasing to about 20 to 27 million barrels a day. If we look at the left-hand chart here about the requirement, if we take all the Middle Eastern crude exports, even as production is increasing, it's not enough to meet that demand. So we're, we're having to get uh, more crude from further further afield, being the Americas or Europe uh, and so forth. So we're seeing longer haul crude trade flows uh, rising. The net to import dependence in Asia is rising to 82% in 2026, up from about 70, 70% in 2019. The developments are also having impacts on the product markets. Uh, we, can, we can see here, sorry, that one. Yes. Yes. Sorry. Um, we're seeing that um, import requirements for products are rising in Europe as refinery capacity uh, is, is being shut relatively uh, decreasing modestly in Africa and Latin America as we're building some new refineries, um, but really increasing very sharp, sharply here in what we call the Asia 4. Uh, that is Australia, Indonesia, New Zealand, and Singapore, that is becoming the largest product importing region, mini region, if you want, um, over the period. Net product imports requirement will rise to about two and a half million barrels a day as these countries are seeing, are shutting their refinery capacity or not building along with demand. So with that, I'll leave you. I think that was my last slide. Uh, I was. I will stop sharing my screen if I can. Um, and then I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Toral. I appreciate it. Uh, before I turn it over to uh, Helen and Colin for their remarks, I just had two very quick uh, clarifying questions. First, um, just for the audience's uh, uh, benefit, what, what was the oil price uh, assumption that sat behind the preparation of that outlook? Yeah. Um, so, of course, preparing this outlook, we had to change our price assumptions continuously, obviously, starting the process uh, early on. But I think that we are about, we were just, uh, we froze sort of the modeling exercises in January, February. So we were at uh, the mid 50s, 60s, about on uh, the front row. Yeah. Okay, so working off more or less the forward strip at that point in time. So, so we were working off the forward strip at that point in time, but, um, you know, yeah. And, and second clarifying question was, um, in the scenario that you developed for more aggressive policies to reduce oil demand, um, my understanding is that that is a kind of a Paris compliant case, not a net zero by 2050 case, which would be even more, need to be even more aggressive. Is that correct? Yeah, it, that is correct. When we're looking at, when we're comparing our, our forecast, I think we don't even, even with these policies, we struggle to get down to the Paris compliance scenario that sees net zero emission by 2070. Uh, getting on, of course, the longer term, getting to 2070, the net zero in 2070, but if you draw the line looking at, the, at this, the, the World Energy Outlook Sustainable Development Scenario, which is consistent with the Paris Agreement, uh, it is even bigger declines than what we have here. So it, it's just to illustrate, we wanted to illustrate what it would take and how challenging it is, not only to get online with uh, the, next, the, the Paris Agreement targets, 
um, but the net zero um, right. targets for 2050. So now there's, um, we're working on at the IEA, a net zero roadmap, uh, a publication that would be, be, be published in April of this year uh, that outlines sort of the pathways on what would need, be needed to get on track for this, even in the sort of medium term um, scenario, yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. I just wanted to clarify those two bits uh, for our audience's benefit. We will come back and have the opportunity to explore these concepts and you know, the sensitivities in more detail uh, shortly. Uh, but first, uh, let me turn it now over to, to Helen and Colin for their uh, sort of some brief you know, observations on, on, on uh, Turrell's presentation and what they see as some of the key issues for the oil market this year and over the next five or so. Uh, Helen, you first. Great. Thanks, Mark. Uh, and thanks, thanks for the opportunity to be part of the panel this morning. It's, uh, it's great to be able to talk about another, another high quality, thoughtful piece of work that, that IEA has, has put out. As, as you noted at the outset, uh, the, the, the markets look to these reports from IEA, so they're, they're very high quality pieces of work. I, I'm just going to make some very, a, a few high level remarks, no, no slides. We can, we can take the conversation whatever direction the audience wants later. So my, I'm, again, I'm going to make a, just a few high-level remarks on, on demand and supply, and then a few comments on policy and energy transition. Uh, when, when we think about oil demand, we, we have a very constructive view on oil demand, not unlike what uh, Coral has just described for the IEA's base case, uh, particularly in, in the time frame that we're focusing on for, for, this, for this discussion being the next five years. Uh, so we're looking for oil demand to regain 2019's level on a sustained basis by probably 2022, and then see moderate growth in, in demand incrementally uh, year after year thereafter. Uh, as Toro highlighted some of the, the very important points regarding the, the level of uncertainty around oil demand today in, in her remarks and in, in the slides, um, there, there, there's always uncertainty. This year, last year, feel like one of those periods where, where there's even, even a greater level of uncertainty than, than we were somewhat accustomed to dealing with. So some of the key things that we think about that, that could push oil demand higher or, or lower or, or less high, perhaps maybe a better way to think about it, are, are things uh, such as consumption patterns, uh, working from home, virtual meetings such as this, uh, where, where we, we meet electronically versus uh, driving and flying. Uh, we're, we're also seeing trends uh, of urban flight from city centers to, uh, to suburbs and rural areas. So people who are able to pick up and relocate or perhaps have a second home are, are doing so. Uh, also seeing some trends of uh, people moving away from using mass transit and preferring personal vehicles instead of, of buses or, or subways. Um, so you have the, those, those factors can work, can work either way to the, to the high side or the low side. And I think there's, there's still a lot that's yet to be known as to how those, those factors are going to play out in the coming years. Uh, but something that another piece of reality that, that sometimes get, gets overlooked by some of the commentators that I hear on the industry is, is the, the heavy level of, of what many are calling economic scarring from, from the shutdowns last year, and those shutdowns are continuing into this year, uh, although on a, a, a more uh, remote basis. Uh, and that's created, that has and is creating a huge income gap, uh, very high levels of not only unemployment, but underemployment. And those things are gonna take time for, for the global economy to recover from. So even though we see uh, a lot of stimulus, fiscal stimulus measures in particular, as well as monetary, uh, being put into place, it's going to take time for a lot of people to get back to work or to get back to the, the type of, of work or type of income that they were previously accustomed to before the pandemic. And that may put a bit of a drag on, on uh, the, the rate at which oil demand grows in the next few years. Uh, but another thing that I want to comment on is, is we, we continue to see some of the pre-pandemic trends carrying forward. Coral also uh, touched on these. That, that's a couple of key ones are the, uh, the uh, fuel efficiency of internal combustion engines. That's one of the major areas that, that has in recent years and will continue into the future to erode the rate of growth of, of crude oil demand is simply 
the, the improvements in engine technology and greater fuel efficiency of internal combustion engines. So you have that as well as the rate at which e electric vehicles can, can penetrate the fleet. And there's a whole host of projections out there. Terrell Tur shared the IEA's projection for EV penetration for over the next few years. And I think my, my response to that is that that's very possible. But as we look at what it takes to produce increasingly large numbers of electric vehicles and specifically the batteries that, that are needed for those electric vehicles. I think there's a lot of, there, there are a lot of questions to be raised as to whether or not some of the projections that are out there are, are realistic, particularly when you start to dig into, uh, no pun intended, but dig into the supply chain of, of the mining sector and the minerals that are needed for, for all those batteries. Um, one other trend that, that's worth commenting on and that, that was also uh, uh, touched on in her slides are the uh, the, the growing use of of, uh, of uh, oil in the pet chem sector. So the the demand the demand growth that that uh, her slides showed for uh, LPGs and and FA. Uh, the pet chem sector uh, has been looked to to be a growth area for for a number of years now uh, as we think about oil demand in, in the future. And a lot of that is is demand for for plastics. So I, a lot of a lot of consumers don't always realize just how much um, petroleum products are in their everyday lives from, from plastics, plastics that are in their electric vehicle in the interior and some of the exterior panels, for example, as, as well as food containers, uh, outdoor gear and clothing, just a whole host of, of everyday consumer products that are ultimately derived from petroleum. <laughs> so uh, in terms of consumer behaviors, those, those consumer behaviors actually support uh, the growth in, in oil demand, although it's a little bit indirect because it's not direct uh, uh, transportation combustion. So where, where all this lands, is, as I said at the outset, is they're, they're both pluses and minuses for oil demand. Our base case is that uh, the oil demand will most likely grow for the foreseeable future. Uh, and and it is, it's also important to think of it as being an enabler to, to energy transition as we go further and further into the future. A couple of quick comments on, on supplies. Um, as IEA stated, uh, the OPEC and Russia today are holding a lot of, of spare capacity off the market. Uh, we expect that to be returned uh, to the market over time. Uh, it's it's not, not entirely clear as to what the pace of, of uh, returning those volumes will be. I think every, everyone's uh, watching, watching and waiting to see what OPEC and Russia decide uh, in, in the, at the next meeting as well as subsequent meetings for how quickly they'll return uh, their, their um, spare capacity. And then, and then, as was also mentioned, uh, Iran becomes a very big wild card, in ter big in terms of the volumes that, that it can Put back into the market uh, when when sanctions are lifted. Um, one other one other country that's affiliated with OPEC that, that we follow closely is Venezuela. Um, we're, we see some upside there. It's not it's not as large a volume, particularly in the next five years. But there's there's a tremendous amount of resource in Venezuela. So as as above ground risks and factors uh, perhaps change in the future. Venezuela is another uh, source of, of potential supply going forward. When we look outside of OPEC and Russia, uh, there, there are a whole host of countries that uh, we see production being able to uh, expand and grow in both the, the medium and longer term. Uh, Canada, Brazil, Guyana, some new discoveries there, Norway, uh, and then of course the US. Uh, we expect US production to, to grow over the next five years Somewhat similar to the to the figures that that Torrell showed in, in the IEA space case outlook, um, that this year, 2021 is still going to be a, a year where the, the industry is transitioning. We, we we may see production decline this summer, but then start to, to turn back up by the end of the year. Uh, as even though capital discipline and returning uh, generating free cash flow return funds to shareholders is the order of the day. With, with prices at the levels that we see them now, not just in the front of the curve, but in the back end of the curve, at those prices, a lot of producers can, can, can do all of those things that they need to do to, to satisfy shareholders or other, other types of investors to help to repair their balance sheet and perhaps to grow production. So we're, we're watching that space very closely. 
the last area I want to comment on on quickly is uh, is policies and, and the energy transition. Uh, one of the most important statements that I think is in the IEA paper is, is where they say whatever the transition pathway, the oil and gas industry has an important role to play. And I think that's that's such an important thing for everyone to keep in mind is policymakers should not overlook the importance of reliable and affordable energy to make the transition to a lower carbon future, while also addressing other UN goals such as poverty, hunger, and education. The world relies on oil and natural gas today because they are affordable and reliable. Until technologies catch up with the policy ambitions, and eventually they will, uh, policymakers should keep in mind that for today, oil and gas are needed along the way to meeting the future targets for, for emissions. So we recognize the factors that, that will mitigate oil uses in the future, as I, I mentioned earlier in my comments, but we also see a lot of positive trends too. So with that, I'll, I'll stop and uh, turn it over to, back over to you, Mark. So uh, maybe I'll just jump in here and make a couple of comments. Um, I agree uh, with everything that Helen said, uh, very well put. And my first observation on the IEA work is it's just simply outstanding. This is an excellent piece of work. It's high quality, it's thoughtful. So I would encourage everybody who is listening to this, watching this uh, online to not only pick up these slides, go back to the 167 page deck that's behind this. Um, it is rich in detail, it is specific, it answers questions, it is balanced. So my hat's off to, to the whole team at the IEA. Toral, your team, great job. It's just really, really first rate. A couple of observations on, on the short-term market, and then I'll also hit some of the long-term. Um, I think you know we have now revealed with prices in the past 24 hours, how important the weather was in February to giving us the sense of the condition of demand. Obviously, in the mid-continent of the United States, we had uh, winter storm Uri give us uh, those horrible days in Texas, Oklahoma, and other parts of the mid-continent. But we also had very cold weather in Japan before that and Northern Europe that had lifted LNG prices uh, pretty significantly to the upside. And so our sense, uh, talking with industry and investors on a daily basis, is that perhaps people you know, ascribe too much to that weather-driven effect and got a little bit carried away uh, with the underlying condition of, of demand. The fact is gas-fired uh, power generation is down year over year in the United States. We still see industrial production in a contraction. We've had a manufacturing recession in the United States that would have been here whether or not we had COVID. So the underlying condition of demand has been soft. Yes, it's picking up as Toro um, showed us, but um, that spare capacity issue is crucial. And so when just a few weeks ago on March 4th, we had OPEC surprise the market, I would count myself among those who were surprised. A lot of that, of course, was a very um, uh, excellent assessment of demand. The demand wasn't there. It made sense to roll over uh, the short term production uh, cuts withheld from the market. And this really gets to the super cycle point. One of the definitions of a super cycle is that demand has to be pressing against the limits of available spare capacity. You, you basically have to be running full out. You can't simultaneously say, um, as some have said in the market, that we're in a super cycle, but then acknowledge that there's 9 million barrels per day of, of spare capacity. That's just something that could come back at current prices, uh, maintenance capex levels, and so on. And so the super cycle story can be true, but it's premature. It's still several years into the future. Um, these are cyclical markets. It will be true at some point in time, but OPEC uh, and its partners has been correct to point out that with the given complexion of inventories needing to come down and this possibility of supply coming back, um, we are not yet in a super cycle. We've been in a mini commodity boom that's been lifted in part by $20 trillion of monetary and fiscal largesse to uh, support it from the, the policy side. But um, we, we really stu still need to get the capacity utilization numbers across industries from the current low 70% numbers that we see in the OECD countries in particular to something that looks more like 80 or above. Then I wanted to um, just turn now to 
uh, new technology. We're also uh, seeing <clears throat> a greater focus on direct air capture, carbon utilization, small uh, modular reactors in nuclear. And at TPH, this is something that we're really focused on. Uh, we talk to a lot of the uh, smaller and larger companies in the space who are working on these technologies. And, you know, even though we're talking about a five-year outlook, and it is pretty hard to have new technology disrupt a five-year outlook, um, we are seeing enough investment that it has our attention as something that could disrupt our view, the IEA's base case, anybody's view. We take it seriously. And when we watch a company like Carbon Engineering come into the Permian and now talk about a 1 million metric ton per year direct air capture project, yes, it is absolutely factually accurate to say that is not at all to scale of the carbon problem in the 30 uh, gigatons plus uh, scale that that problem is at. But it is a step that would have to be taken to address that problem. And so we watch that. We watch uh, utility scale battery storage. We watch geothermal. All of it is important. And with that in mind, there's also a simple thought experiment we can do to prove that what Helen said has to be true. Uh, in terms of the placement of hydrocarbons within the deck for demand, looking out into the very distant future. So if you bear with me for a second, imagine that you took away all of the fuel uses of hydrocarbons. So you left only that non-fuel component. And looking at the IEA deck, let's just say for the sake of argument that with the wave of my magic wand, I just took away 80% of demand in year one. Well, the residual going through the petrochemical sleeve, let's say that it grows at 3.5% as the compound annual growth rate, the CAGR through time. If you run that math, what you'll find is even in that most extreme scenario where I've gotten rid of all of gasoline, all of diesel, including the motorcycles, we're not just talking about the sedans, it's the boats, it's the lawnmowers, none of it. There's no hydrocarbon use in any of it. At a 3.5% CAGR, it will take only 48 years for the residual to get back to be the same size as the starting point. In other words, by the year 2069, you have a hydrocarbon industry that is completely directed towards petrochemicals, but would still have many of the same issues we have today. And then if you push back and said, okay, well, what if we had a 1.75% CAGR? Yes, the answer gets pushed out in time. It's 94 years, it's 2115. The point is we haven't solved the problem, even in the most extreme scenario. And along the way, perhaps we made some policy decisions that were injurious to the well-being of human civilization, that we, we hurt communities too much to arrive at a solution that didn't really get the job done. And I think that what's interesting about that is now pivoting to the ESG question, um, it, I think we all can agree that Europe, Canada, and some other parts of the world, some jurisdictions of the world, were ahead of the United States in its focus on ESG. But we have seen uh, in the past 18 months a very strong movement, even among uh, US EMP companies and others, to build in an ESG uh, framework in their operations. And one, one thing that might be worth debating is, are we seeing kind of the Americans starting from behind have gotten sort of focused on solving the problem and other parts of the world are still trying to implement a fiat policy? And, and I don't have a strong view on that, but I'm beginning to suspect the answer may be yes. And as I watch some of the comparisons with the COVID vaccine rollouts, I mean, it is pretty incredible what can happen in the United States when it puts its mind to something and to have 2 million doses per day plus of the vaccine rollout um, is certainly something that I think all of us may have been skeptical about six months ago, but it is the fact that is what is happening on the ground. When one focuses on Having that engineer's mentality, solving the problem, as opposed to the policymaker's uh, perspective of we already decided on the policy and I, no matter what, I'm going to go down that path, no matter what, what happens or changes. And to that effect, I thought there was something in Toral's deck that was really very interesting, and that is to quantify what would be the demand savings from the change in behavior efficiency and the EV effect. And I think most people, especially enthusiasts for electric vehicles would think most of it comes from the electric vehicle. But of course, if we're talking 55, 60, 70 million vehicles where we have 1.5 billion on road today, the, the value of that slide was to show how much of it comes from the change in behavior. And it very well may be the case that many of the OECD countries will begin to implement 
um, some tolerance for working from home. And we do lose that one, two, three days a week for uh, many of those would be commuters. But um, I, I think that was that was a, a super value add as, as a slide. So thank you for that. And then I guess just one final point. Um, the ambitious hit to demand being at 5.6 million barrels per day by, by 2026. I go back to my, my Kager thought experiment. I was talking about getting rid of 80 million barrels per day or something in that zip code. And here, um, you know, in this very thoughtful presentation, it's really tough to even get to 5.6. And so what I think that that illustrates for us is I think policymakers with this very valuable deck in hand need to take a step back and say, well, wait a minute, you know, hydrocarbons have provided a, a level of wealth and security and alleviation of suffering that is unprecedented in human history. It is absolutely essential for the well-being of billions of people. We need to get more uh, people access to electricity and so on, as BP has um, highlighted for years in its statistical uh, review that, that Mark and, and his colleagues um, have produced over time. And I think that, uh, you know, sort of looking at it, one of the key questions is maybe the policy debate needs to get back to, well, how much of the coal should be replaced with nuclear for power generation? And if, you know, so many products are, require um, a, a petrochemical feedstock, you know, what is the role of gas on the, the non-fuel side or the role of oil? Um, but I'll leave those as some questions and turn it back to Mark. Thank you, Colin, and to uh, Helen as well for the uh, insightful commentary, uh, you know, around uh, Turl's presentation. Um, I want to thank also uh, all of you who are joining us online. There have been some questions coming in, um, and we will be turning to those very shortly. If you have um, them, now is your time to, uh, to add to your question to the mix. Um, a number of people have asked uh, for copies of Torrell's slides, um, and she has agreed that we'll be able to share those. We'll post them uh, afterwards on our website. Uh, and I have also shared in the chat uh, function a link to the main IEA report. So, um, so boy, there is so much to unravel here. You know, in the short term, um, you know, one, we, every, I think everybody at some point mentioned Saudi Arabia. Um, and I, Saudi Arabia has played such a crucial role in the market over the last year in terms of, you know, the price war, but also the, pro the production cuts, the uh, development of an enforcement mechanism for OPEC, uh, the additional cuts uh, of a million barrels a day. I would love to, to hear, you know, to, you know, the panelists or, uh, or, or some subset of you, some commentary on what you think is, you know, uh, how should we think about the factors that will drive Saudi behavior going from this point forward for the rest of this year and into the medium term? Toro, would you like to go first? Sure. Uh, yes, difficult question, I guess. No, Saudi, Saudi Arabia, I, I, I think that we can say that, I mean, Saudi Arabia has really uh, taken a they always had a very important role and played an important role in the oil markets being one of the biggest producers and exporters out there. Um, but I think we've seen that they're really taking, uh, playing a bigger role um, along with Russia, coordinating um, supply cuts, um, but now increasingly um, by themselves to providing additional cuts and so forth. Um, and I think that now by cutting by an extra million barrels a day, just from, from March, February and March, and now into April, uh, Saudi Arabia is sitting about 4 million barrels a day of spare capacity. That's a million barrels a day more than the entire North Sea, right? So this is sort of their ability to influence markets in the short term. We can talk about, okay, we talk about the disruptions in US production and we're still waiting for final data to see actually how big that disruption was. We don't have, uh, it will be still a few months until we get consolidated data uh, to see that. But you know, when we talk about disruptions in the North Sea or we have disruptions or maintenance, it pales, it pales to comparison to see sort of the room for maneuvering that Saudi Arabia has today. So it's clear that, that, that they having, and, and as we move forward, this investments and project development outside of the Middle East is sort of slowing down. 
um, we're seeing that you know those countries there they didn't cut investments. The it, hydrocarbons remain very important part of their portfolio, whereas the IOCs and increasingly um, you know the international companies focusing on diversifying their investment into clean energy. Um, I'm not saying that the, the national companies are not also doing the including sort of clean energy transition strategies in their portfolio, but hydrocarbon remains at the core, right? So I think that their influence as they bring back productions, that market share increase, uh, they will retain sort of this, um, this role, market management role for, for the coming years. Um, and I think, but, you know, listening to, to commentaries at the OPEC plus meeting, think that and now that they agreed to hold monthly meetings instead of the sort of the quarterly or semi-annual meetings, market management meetings, it means that they're really trying to balance the market. You know, they're really, as we said, you know, they're assessing demand on a monthly basis. There's so much uncertainty on how the, the COVID pandemic will develop, how mobility will, you know, with the new variants, with the vaccines, so them taking, you know, assessing market on a monthly basis that, you know, not put too much oil on the market at one time or not withholding too much oil from the market. I think it's in the interest of nobody to have um, so much volatility in oil prices and, and the markets. And I think that uh, the producer economies have stated as much volatility is not in the interest. They want to have stable market, which means balanced markets. So, you know, that's sort of, um, what do we think without without pretending to know what what lays behind the thinking of any of the, the producers. But that's the way we understand it from sort of the comments that have been made. OK, thank you. Um, let me turn uh, for, for Helen and Colin. A question has come in from the audience on, you know, at 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 the prices that we've seen more recently at 70 bucks, you know, what how would the U.S. supply outlook be different? So I, I'll, I'll jump in first. Uh, at seventy dollars, uh, it it. So going back to a couple of comments I made earlier, uh, at at that price level, um, it, even with a backwardated curve, for for companies that want want to hedge, prices are across the curve are going to be a, very likely going to be at at a level high enough to to let them do everything one, one could want to do, including grow, grow, your, grow your business, grow production, um, have, a, have a strong balance sheet, pay down some debt, uh, as well as have free cash flow to, to return to, to your investors. So uh, that, that is a price level that I think starts to let, uh, let companies do a lot and uh, would inevitably likely put, put, us, put us on a path to higher growth rates in output. Uh, I, I, I'd still, I would still argue that many companies will, will continue uh, to um, be disciplined in their, their level of reinvestment for production growth, uh, thereby favoring, somewhat favoring pay returning funds to, to investors. But that's one class of companies, uh, a whole different sec, set, um, subsector of companies uh, would would likely be growing production. So what I think of my base case, it bottom line is is it would at that price level, it would raise my raise my base case outlook for for US production. Probably doesn't necessarily get us back to million barrels a day year on year growth that we that we saw for for several years uh, last decade. Uh, but but something something above 500 a day uh, would would probably start to look much more realistic. So 500,000 barrels a day, per year, which is, yeah. 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 yeah so, so, so Colin, how about you? I mean, between, between, um, you know, his excellency, his Royal Highness, uh, the Saudi minister saying, you know, drill baby drill is gone and a million barrels a day of growth that we saw, you know, in the years leading up to COVID, you know, where, where's your view on, you know, what is the upside for us supply, you know, in the kind of current price environment? Yeah, I, I think it's very important to understand that the message has been received, live within the lines of free cash flow. The investors have absolutely pummeled the independent companies. And, you know, I, I was in a meeting with a CFO of a company and I mentioned my number for spare capacity in the United States. And, and he was quick 
to, to try to correct me and say, no, there's none, there's zero, zero spare capacity. And now I, I don't agree with that view. I think that, you know, under the classic definition of at a price and being able to bring it on in a certain period of time, we clearly have some spare capacity in the United States. We could, you know, debate what the exact number is. But that was telling because uh, that is a company that could, uh, you know, bring back some of the production and they very much want to um, do what the investors are telling them to do. They are responding to their stakeholders and not just, you know, economic stakeholders, all stakeholders, they accept that mandate. So I think that's, that's an interesting change and it's one that's been demanded by activists and, and that is how the behavior of these companies have, has changed. Now, arguably there's some price, you know, well above here where that who would dissipate and we would see a different behavior, of course. But I also think getting back to the question of backwardation, Helen's exactly right on that, that, you know, this is sort of an artificial backwardation in the sense of it's not demand driven. It was engineered in order to draw down inventories in the OECD countries. And another slide in the IEA deck shows Chinese inventory, which is not in that OECD number. And that is now a capacity that's pushing 1.5 billion barrels. Now that's a rather large number. And you know, yes, it includes some SPR, you know, given whatever distinction that means in China, but um, it's, it's a hefty number. And if you look at the flows of oil into China in the second half of 2020, it is clear that it was price responsive. Um, in order to balance supply and demand in the instantaneous present, China needed to take about 10 million barrels per day. They routinely took more than 11, according to all of the statistics that we can look at. So very sharp uh, commercial behavior. Yes, I will buy on the low, put it into inventory, and I can draw. One thing that surprised me with the data that we received most recently in March for the Jan Feb period was that we got another print above 11 million barrels per day. I expected the December number at nine to, to sort of continue to go. So my view was wrong on that. Now, there's an argument that what's been happening is the Iranian production that Toro talked about is kicking up and the Chinese are taking those barrels at a discount to Dubai. And, and that does seem to be happening. And so maybe this is, again, a short-term trading effect. But back to the core question, my succinct answer would be, I think um, we're going to be surprised in the very near term that the shale producers, the light tight oil producers in particular, will not chase a higher price and probably, you know, are, are kind of looking at what happened yesterday with price and saying, you know what, I'm going to take my time. But I do think that once you go out to the five-year horizon and the IA forecast, um, Helen's number and Toral's numbers both do make sense. Let me keep the focus on the U.S. Um, but move downstream. I mean, uh, Toral, you 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 showed an outlook for global refining that is pretty tough. Um, you know that you know there's a need for significant rationalization here in the United States. I would argue uh, that uh, U.S. refiners have been protected from that. You know, uh, over the last uh, decade or so, partly because demand here is held up better than it has in places like Europe or Japan, uh, but partly because U.S. refiners are world scale, technically competitive, and benefited from a lot of bottled up North American supply. Um, going forward, you have an outlook that shows no growth in gasoline demand, which is what U.S. refineries are built to make. Um, a pretty modest growth profile for North American supply. So maybe the bottlenecks aren't there. Um, and I'm just in interested in views on where the United States refining industry falls into the uh, you know, competitive space going forward. Sure, sure. I had some slides on that. I think we have some slides in that in our page 147 about or something in our report. Um, no, it's, it's true that in, over the last few years, we're looking at the U.S. refining industry has been doing very well, uh, cheaper feedstocks compared to other places in the world, good margins. Um, but U.S. refining activity has really been, met, been to meet increasing U.S. demand, right? We saw, I think it was uh, 2018, 2019, uh, U.S. oil demand still growing relatively strongly or, or you know, the biggest growth of any country was the United States. Um, so, um, and of course the US refining industry has been supported by uh, good export market opportunities, especially to Mexico, which have had problems with their refining sector, refineries running at 40% utilization, 50%, 60%. Um, of course, Mexico has plans to, to to resolve some of those issues, uh, planning to invest in their downstreams, to 
renovate the existing refineries, build new refineries. Um, so we're, we're sort of seeing, um, and there has been some announced shutdowns also in the United States, um, but at the same time, some investments going on in, in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, I think that um, the US, I mean, there isn't really, um, there, there isn't really any, uh, any, any downside sort of to, to, the, to the US. They have, um, you know, refinery activity is expected to pick up in 2021, but a gradual sort of recovery. Um, some of the export markets that they have been feeding are sort of falling away uh, as demand is sort of growth is slowing or as new refinery capacity is building up in those areas. So I think US, um, it, it's sort of a mixed bag a little bit, um, of some opportunities, but also challenges as the demand growth is shifting to different sort of areas. US refineries are obviously geared towards max gasoline production. Uh, and when gasoline demand globally sort of slowing down, um, you know, some refineries better place to meet sort of the new demand barrel than others. Okay. So in the time we have left, I'd like to ask each of each of you, um, there've been a number of questions coming in on, you know, well, what about this technology or that technology, or what are the, some of the key uncertainties? And that's what I want to ask each of you to end with. You know, I'll give you one minute each to tell me what are the key things that you're worrying about or the key opportunities that you're focused on, you know, you know from, from where you sit, you know, a minute each. Um, Helen, why don't you take this first? Sure, thanks, Mark. Um, so it's there. I could start by saying that there, there are a whole litany of things that, that we worry about in terms of, of running a business like, like anyone does. But uh, for, for this conversation, I'd, I'd start, I'd focus on uh, we, we spend a lot of time looking at the different pathways that, that oil demand may take in the future, oil as well as natural gas, of course. Uh, and and in, in the way that we run our business, we, we, we do rely on scenario planning. We have used comprehensive energy scenarios so we, so we can look at a whole range of, of outcomes across across the, the oil and natural gas space and in various various demand sectors. Uh, so we so that we, we do spend a lot of time uh, focusing on what are the what, what are the areas where consumer behaviors may change? Again, going back to the IEA. Uh, Format that that Paul introduced earlier on, uh, that that's that's critical. Is is what what is it consumers are both willing and able to to pay for? What do they want? What types of, of products do they want to consume? How do they want energy served up to them? So there's that aspect. There, and then there's what what does technology allow? That that of course factors into what what does it cost consumers to consume? Uh, so what what are, what are the enabling technologies on on the demand side? Uh, as well as the supply side, but for, to, to reiterate on demand, some of the things I mentioned earlier regarding enabling technologies uh, for electric vehicles, better battery technology, cleaner, cleaner uh, battery supply chains, and so forth. There's a whole host of, of elements there. Uh, and then, so that, that covers a lot of the demand side issues. Uh, for, for the supply side uncertainties, uh, it is, it, it's again about technology or what, are the what may be the next technology breakthrough in the oil and gas production sector that similar to, similar to what the industry did with tight oil and shale gas, we have another major step change in, in the cost structure that, that opens up a whole host of, of new, new capabilities to, to deliver uh, affordable, reliable energy to the world. So a whole range of, of things in, in both, both those buckets, as, as well as policies. And I touched on some of the policies earlier. So. Okay. Turn it back over. Thanks. Thanks, Helen. Helen, what's on your, your one minute list? So I'll pick up that last point. Um, recently, I heard somebody talk about available, abundant, reliable, but put the word always in front of it. And it reminds me a lot of when telephony used to demand 100% reliability for long line service. And then we all got cell phones and 96 became a standard that we could all live with. Well, there's a big difference between 96% reliable heating and lighting and 100%. And so the number one thing I'm worried about is that policymakers and the general public underestimate the crucial, critical importance of hydrocarbons, especially oil and gas, not just for the next year, not just for the next five years, 
for as far as I can project it out in any kind of reasonable, logical way of running the kind of scenario analysis that Helen's talking about. And for me, one tell is when I listen to policymakers or, or the media talk about some scenarios, I can see when they've run the numbers and when they have not. Because when you run the numbers, you get the kind of stuff that Helen's talking about and Toro's talking about. When you don't run the numbers, you start just having you know, scenarios that sound fantastic, but are completely unrealistic and will not happen. And then what happens is policy acts upon aspiration and you get the kind of shortfalls we saw in California last summer, and the kind of uh, consequences we saw uh, in Texas and elsewhere this winter, where you know the question maybe should have been the whole time, should we winterize some of these assets in Texas? And maybe we shouldn't accelerate the uh, rapid retirement of gas fire generation in you know California, society of 40 million people, uh, before we actually have the batteries yet. You know, there was a sequence here that maybe got glossed over a little bit too glibly. As for technology, I've already mentioned the two that most grip my fascination and attention. Um, you know, it, it, again, when you run the numbers, it's pretty clear that it would be a good idea to have technology to pluck the carbon out of the atmosphere and to begin to have a whole systems kind of approach. And though 400 plus parts per million is higher than it's been uh, in the entire industrial age, 400 out of a million is still a pretty small concentration. It's hard to go find this resource. And so we will need to have massive investment. On the nuclear side, again, back to the COVID vaccine parallel, in the same way that it, it's not true that the vaccine research started in the year 2020. Some of this mRNA research started decades ago and hit fruition in 2020 and 2021. And so already we can see that there are teams at MIT and other universities working on fusion. And I will not be surprised at all if I wake up one day in the year 2023 and there's some breakthrough from some fabulous physicist or engineer at some university in the world who gives us a different way of doing things. And it's that technology right. that I don't feel that I could really you know, get ahead of ahead of time. Okay. Great, thank you. Toro, yeah, last but by no means least, uh, what, what's gonna be the special focus area for the next year's five-year IEA oil market outlook? Oh, I schedule my post postmortem for Tuesday when we're going to discuss what we're going to look at for next year. So I'll, I'll get back to you on that one. <laughs> but clearly it's, I mean, we're looking at how the energy transitions and how policies can, can change the outlook rapidly. And even though in, in our report, we don't really see, uh, you know, any shortfalls of supply over these, these years, you know, even though demand continues to rise. I mean, we're looking, looking a little bit beyond, uh, you know, this, this five-year period. Once the spare capacity cushion is being drawn down, we're seeing that, you know, if you look at both the supply side and demand side, we're seeing that sort of the investment levels that we have today, it's more or less consistent with, with the sustainable development scenario where oil demand does decline over even in, in the medium term uh, and beyond, then we, you do see the peak in oil demand. And you're seeing on the demand side, you're, you're, you're really not seeing, uh, you're not seeing this, this trajectory at all. And you know, the demand world is continuing to increase. Uh, we're more on sort of a, you know, upward you goes. Whereas on the supply side, the investment side uh, is, a, is in a different scenario altogether. So for now, because of the spare capacity that has built up, you know, we're not we're not so worried. But you know, we cannot live in two different scenarios uh, for a long time. So something has to give. You know, and we're looking at sort of the the energy transition. It needs to be an orderly transition. It has implication for geopolitics, security of supply, very important to. To, to the IEA and our member countries and beyond. So, you know, it's sort of these things that we're looking at how it will balance uh, with so much uncertainty on the demand side. Do we risk, you know, going on different trajectories altogether? So, so, so this is sort of where, where we're thinking and, you know, looking at. Great, okay, thank you very much. Well, let's bring it home. Um, yeah, we've had a great wide ranging conversation. You know, Toral, thank you for sharing the IEA's you know, you know, world-leading uh, research 
uh, on the oil market. Uh, thank you also to Helen and Colin for their insightful contributions. You know, what I heard was that you know the world needs energy. We all need energy to run our everyday lives and to run our modern economy. Um, we also need to reduce CO2 emissions. You know, and therein lies the rub. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. You know, the good news is that the creativity and the ingenuity of the energy industry here in the U.S. and around the world you know, has proven very adept at finding surprising solutions when the incentives line up properly. And I think that's you know one of the real challenges from the policy perspective. You know, for those of us you know here at the Baker Institute for Public Policy Studies, um, there's a lot of research going on you know along these lines you know within the Baker Institute as well as uh, within the institutions represented on this call and worldwide. We have got our work cut out for us, but you know when we get our minds to it, you know I think we have a good record of being able to do it. Yeah, you know, and so let's get to work. Let me wrap up there. Thanks to our panelists and thanks to each of you for taking time out. I'd also like to thank Andrew and Cecilia from the Baker Institute team for their help in putting this webinar together. Hope that you all stay well, have a good weekend and good luck with your brackets. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you again. <laughs>